Good morning, church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning, and, and we're thankful for the sunshine. We can only see it coming in the windows, but um, the beautiful sunny drive in this morning was um, just such a reminder of God's beauty. Um, just a couple of announcements to share with you this morning. These are pretty exciting ones. I know times right now feel um, long and tedious, and, and we're all kind of getting a little fatigued, but uh, we have a couple new babies that have been born, and how great, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I know if you were all here, we'd be, we'd be clapping and cheering. So <laughs> thanks, guys. We, uh, the, the first baby was born to Michael and Mason Williams on Friday, January 29th, a little baby boy named Bo Silas. So that's the very first one. The next one was one day later. How cool is that? So the next day, um, Miles and Amanda Jansen had a little baby girl, Rachel Leanne, born on Saturday the 30th. So Yay, excited, congratulations for them. We're Ooh. so stoked for the, the new young life that, that is still being brought forward. And if, we, if you happen to see them or, or even know them and take the opportunity to give them a call or a message and encourage and, and send congratulations and encouragement. So we're super stoked for them. Um, as we begin together, I just invite you and encourage you to bow your heads in prayer with us. Dear Lord, as always, we are we are so thankful for all that we have and all that you have blessed us with. And right now, even though some of us might be a little bit tired of, of things and a little bit tired of watching another church on, on a screen, God, we are still thankful we can do it and we are still thankful that you have blessed us with the things and the technology we have to do this. God, we ask that you remind us that you are our comfort and, and as we begin to enter this service together. God, help us to feel each other around us as a body still. Remind us of your love and of your mercy and bring us joy as we get to partake in this morning together. In your name, amen. We just invite you now to join us wherever you are. And if you feel led to stand, go on and do that too and join us as we, as we sing together.
is worthy of all of our praise. This next one we're about to sing might be a little bit new to some of you. I hope you had the chance to hear it last week. Um, it's just a great song with um, wonderful words and a reminder of our, of our holy God. So if you know it, we encourage you to join in. If not, we enjoy you to, or encourage you to learn it with us and, and find joy as we get to still worship together.
is our holy God. Morning. How are you doing? Honestly, how are you doing? Um, I ask that because this is meant to be a time where we are authentic before God and one another. And even though the one another aspect has been uh, put on hold for a bit, God still wants us when we are together and in his presence to be authentic before him. And I know for a fact that for some of us, the answer to that question is not fine. Whereas maybe for others of us, it is fine. But what I want to do before we turn our attention to uh, God's word this morning is just to spend a, a minute or two in prayer. And um, there's certain things I want to pray for, but part of what I want to do is pray for you uh, in the place that you're in right now. And if you are in a good place right now, I want you just in faith to lift up those within uh, the church body and those who might be joining us from outside our community. Uh, Just in faith, lift them up to God and uh, trust that those of us who have specific needs this morning, um, we will in faith bring those needs boldly uh, before our Heavenly Father who promises us grace and wisdom. So uh, please join me as we pray. Father, it is just so amazing that we are able to boldly approach the throne. That because of Jesus, we don't look at our own righteousness as being the means by which we can be in your presence because it is Christ's righteousness in us that has secured eternally this place that we are in. And thank you that we don't have to put on masks (laughs) before you. And even though masks are kind of a way of life right now for a while, what a powerful reminder to us that this isn't how we're supposed to live as humans, but more than that, you never want us to live with masks before you as your children. So God, we want to just remove those masks before you. And you know how we're doing. And some of us, we're in a good place right now. But for some of us, it's been a real struggle for various reasons not just because of the pandemic and all the restrictions, but God, some of us are really struggling uh, with health, with stress of finance. God, some of us are struggling in relationships with our kids or our spouses. And some of us are just really lonely and discouraged. And God, thank you that right now there are hundreds that are joined together in faith that we're united in Christ together as your children. So, Father, we want to lift up all of those who have needs before you. And we pray that by your gracious love and mercy, by your power, that you would meet those needs. Father, that you would encourage, that you would provide, that you would bring strength and healing. God, where you would bring connection to others. And please, may our eyes remain fixed on you, because that is what you call us to do, especially in times like this. That we would, in faith, keep our eyes fixed on the author of our faith, because he's also the perfecter of our faith. And so we pray that, as your people, you would lift us up this week as we, in faith, come to you. 
Holy Spirit, that you would fill us afresh, that the word would be illuminated to our hearts and minds this week, that we could be a blessing as we share the hope which we profess with others in times like this especially. And so, Lord, I ask that by the time we uh, conclude this service together, that we will feel encouraged because we know we have met with you and that in spirit we are together and you bind us together. And so we pray that now you would feed us from your word, that it would not be any opinions of the word of man that we hear about. God, may, may that just fall to the side, but may your word take deep root within our heart and change us. Make us more like Jesus. That the hope of his return would be that which gives us joy evermore. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you have a smart device or an analog version of the Bible, you can uh, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're continuing a portion of Scripture, which I had to break in half simply because there was just too much to go into in, in one, uh, one sermon. But this is 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. We're going to be looking at verses 19 to 21 um, this morning specifically. Peter... In his second letter, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, this is his final message to the church. He knows that God has made it clear that he's going to die for his faith and soon. And this is his final message to a church that is waging battle against those that would seek to undermine Peter and the apostles' message. And that message is the gospel, the hope that is found in Jesus. And it is good for us to go through this letter because this is a battle that rages on today, and it's a spiritual battle. It's not a political battle. Some people have made it a political battle. It's not. It is a spiritual battle. Many reject the gospel. They deny it. Many drift from believing the message of the gospel because they don't believe the truth or the trustworthiness of the message about Jesus. And for some, their faith is shaken by doubts or they are unable to stand firm when the attacks come their way. And so Peter's intention is that he wants to bolster and solidify that foundational faith upon which uh, their lives are being lived And he defends the faith by giving testimony as to why he is willing to face death for what he has taught. Two witnesses have convinced Peter. And I want to just read through the first three verses that we looked at last week so that we can be in context here. Peter says, there's two things that have convinced me. Two reasons why I'm willing to go to my death for the sake of what I taught you. Here's number one. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. These aren't things we made up. This isn't like the other myths and things that the uh, Greek-speaking people talk about and are familiar with. No, we were, and here's the first testimony, eyewitnesses of his majesty. And this is, of course, referring to the account of the transfiguration. For when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So as incredible as them seeing and them hearing all these amazing things, and maybe you and I think that, well, if we saw that, if we heard it, that would be more than enough. I'd I'd go to the grave for what I believe because I'd know it. I'd see it. I'd hear it. But we're told that we are a people that walk by faith, not by sight. And God is not going to give us that encounter that Peter had, but it is a very important witness. And as incredible as that face-to-face encounter with Jesus in his true glory, a glimpse, a vision of how he would return, as incredible as that was, 
there was something else, a second witness that was just as powerful that testified along with what they heard and what they saw regarding the authenticity of the message surrounding who Jesus is and what he has done. And that second testimony is the testimony of the Word of God. So this is the second of two witnesses, both essential in the affirmation of the apostles' teaching of the gospel. And biblically, some of us might know, there is significance in the testimony of two witnesses in establishing the authenticity concerning an event. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Peter says, that first witness was present. We, we've had that, but we have something. Now, this is amazing. We have something more sure. The prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter is arguing that the trustworthiness of the message and the fact of Jesus' return is now founded upon also this second witness, which is the testimony of the Word of God. Now the term prophetic word or prophecy is used interchangeably with the whole of the Old Testament scriptural witness. It doesn't only refer to specific books that we think is prophetic because Jewish people understood that prophets, the term referred to everyone who was a divinely inspired author of scripture from Moses to Malachi. And it's interesting because that may lend some understanding to Ephesians chapter 4 where it states that the church was given the apostles, the prophets to the church as a foundational gift of leadership. It could be that Paul's referring to the gift of leadership, this foundation that the church is built upon with Christ being the chief cornerstone, the apostles and the prophets. Well, that refers to the writers of the canon of scripture, which again upholds the significance of the Word of God in the life of the follower of Jesus. So Peter's letter here is actually one of the most powerful statements in the New Testament concerning the authority of God's Word. These scriptures, these prophetic words, these promises, these prophecies, they are written through human authors, but their source is God himself. A familiar passage to many of us is one that Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, referring to the Old Testament as well as the New Testament writings, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness. Their authority is divine. And as such, they are trustworthy because the source of the scriptures are not from man, but from God, and he used human authors to write them. Now, this is a fascinating thing I'm about to tell you. The Jewish people held the voice from heaven, and that's a reference to God speaking on Mount Sinai. They held the voice of heaven as being inferior to the written and delivered word of God, the law and the prophets. That's significant. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around that because we think, well, surely a voice from heaven would have more clout, more authority. That's not what the Jewish people believed. And it's significant for us to know this because you and I live in a time where many are disregarding the written word in search of a spoken word because we think somehow that has more authority when it comes uh, to matters regarding God. And so these people mistakenly allow 
the delivered, written, authoritative, divinely inspired, complete, sufficient word of God to become subservient to whatever spoken voice they claim to have heard. And we, we run into this all the time. Well, the word of God says this, but God told me. I've run into people who completely disregard what the teaching is in the New Testament around many things because they claim that God told them it was okay. And not only are they incorrectly putting the Word of God subservient to a spoken voice, but they're allowing a spoken voice which is not God to now direct them in their lives, even though it contradicts what God's Word clearly says. And it's completely backwards to what the people of God knew to be true in this era, that the written word had a higher authority than that spoken word because the Jewish people believed that the time of the prophets had ended. And so the written word had the final authority for them. And it's why they treasured the scriptures so much. It was believed by the Jewish people that God spoke to his people more fully in the written word of God than when he did in speaking to them from Mount Sinai. And now, Peter says that the voice from heaven heard at the transfiguration of Jesus not only affirmed the identity of Christ, it also reaffirms the divine authority and origins of the written word because it fulfills prophecy that the written word spoke of. And I'm going to get into that. It's hard to overemphasize the apostles' regard for the Old Testament. For Jesus, if you were to read through the the gospel accounts, how many times did Jesus say, it is written, it is written, it is written? The reason he does that was that for Jesus and the Jewish people, saying it is written was adequate to settling an argument. It's like the ultimate mic drop. It is written, boom, boom can't argue against that. Well, God told me, no, he didn't. It is written. So the written word of God, the scriptures, or as Peter refers to them, the prophetic word, have an absolutely top place in the minds and lives of God's people at that time as being the ultimate source of authority, even more than the voice born from heaven. And because of that, The written word was the foremost witness for Peter because in God's written word, they found absolute assurance. Peter's in essence saying here, if you don't believe me, go to the scriptures. Mic drop. Because they confirm everything. Now, Peter here is talking about the divine origin of scripture. And there there were two charges from the false teachers. Number one, they had the accusation that the apostles were making myths up about Jesus, much like other Greeks were at that time as well, to try and control them. That everything about Jesus, his power, his his coming again, is all made up. And Peter says, not so. We were with him at the transfiguration. We saw this. We're willing to die for it. So either we're nut jobs or we're right. He then gives evidence that the Old Testament, as a witness, is even more unimpeachable than the apostles themselves. And the critics respond to that by simply rejecting the authority of the Old Testament. Ah, it's not from God. It has no authority in our lives. They deny its divine origin, and they say that, well, maybe you didn't make it up, but the prophets surely made up their own ideas. So Peter strongly reasserts the conviction common to Jews and Christians and to Jesus that the Old Testament has a divine origin, and when the prophets spoke the prophecies recorded in Scripture, they were men divinely inspired by God who acted as his spokesman or his mouthpiece. That's why in verse 20 he says, know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 verse 70 said that God spoke, how did he speak? By the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. God spoke through his word. People might have wanted to hear the voice born from heaven, but God said, no, this is how I'm speaking to you. And you will accept this as divinely 
authoritative in your life. One of the most powerful arguments for the truth of Christianity is the argument from prophecy. Namely, that specific prophecies written centuries, some of them a few millennia prior to Christ, were specifically and supernaturally fulfilled by Jesus in a way that no one could control. Peter, in his sermon in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 18, said that God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets. And what did he fulfill? That his Messiah would suffer. And that's a reference back to Isaiah 42 specifically, which we're going to look at in a second. So Peter is teaching that the Old Testament has specific prophecies now concerning the events of the transfiguration and of Christ that were confirmed in what they saw and heard. At the transfiguration, Jesus is confirmed as the promised and chosen Messiah and is enthroned as God's anointed king on God's holy mountain. Now, those are specific uh, usages of words that are very uh, intentional because of how they correlate to prophecy in the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 2, for example, the entire psalm is about Christ and this event. Verses 6 to 7 of Psalm chapter 2 say this, God says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The father in Matthew 17, 5, in chapter 17 of Matthew is one of the accounts of the transfiguration. The father said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And the apostles would have understood that this is fulfilling everything that Psalm chapter 2 was pointing to. And that's just Psalm chapter 2 as well. The entire uh, chapter of Isaiah chapter 42, which is considered one of the suffering servant songs in the book of Isaiah, I just want to read a couple of verses to you from that. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, this is speaking of the coming Messiah, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. We immediately think of Jesus' baptism, the spirit descending on him like a dove. The father saying, this is my son, I am well pleased with him. I delight in him. Verse 6 of Isaiah 42. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. This is referring to Jesus being given as the new and greater covenant, a light for the nations, which we're also going to look at specific prophetic words concerning the coming Messiah that are fulfilled in Jesus, and Peter will show us that in just a moment. A light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind and bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. These prophecies were fulfilled when the Father spoke to the apostles and they heard that voice, and they saw Christ's glory. And that event where the Father said, this is the one I was speaking of. This is my chosen beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. He's the Messiah. Listen to him. Because he's not only the Messiah, he's the great king that the rest of Psalm chapter 2 speaks of. And he will return to judge the living and the dead. This event was a key fulfillment of prophecy, making the prophetic witness all the more sure, all the more certain, all the stronger, because it confirmed all the prophecies pertaining to this in the Old Testament. The scriptures confirm the teachings of the apostles that Jesus was appointed by the Father to be the promised Messiah, and the authenticity of this message is confirmed by the witness of God's prophetic word, which is fulfilled in Christ. So, Peter says, you will do well to pay attention to this prophetic word as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So because the Old Testament scriptures are strongly reconfirmed, pay attention to this word. 
You would do well to do this. The Greek, and we can't really translate it in the English, it's, a, it's almost a pleading, a begging, pay attention to the word of God. And the latter half of verse 19, of which I'm referring to here, contains the main point of the argument and the central point of the entire letter thus far. Pay attention to God's word. Because it is a lamp, a light shining in a dark place. Because it is more fully confirmed. The scriptures are like a lamp illuminating the darkness. We're familiar with Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. And Peter pleads with the church to let the word of God direct them, guide them, illuminate their lives. Are we paying attention to God's word? Are you and I allowing God's word to be the light for the path I find myself on and yourself on? Or is it sitting closed and our hands are raised up saying, God, speak to me, speak to me, I want to hear the voice from heaven. When the entire time the voice from heaven has said, here is my written word and it's the light that you need because it's pointing you to the light of Christ. We're on a pilgrimage throughout our lives in this dark world. God has graciously provided us with the lamp, the scriptures. And if we pay attention to them for our own reproof, for warning, for guidance, for encouragement, we will walk safely. If we neglect them, we won't be able to stand firm and we'll drift from God. And the whole course of our lives ought to be governed by God's word. Everything. God will never guide us in a way that differs from the Word of God. And if anyone tells you that God told them it's okay to blank, and you know for a fact that the Word says otherwise, the voice they're hearing is not from God, it's demonic, or else they've made it up in their own minds. Believers need this Word for direction. This need doesn't end until Jesus returns. We would do well to pay attention to this. It's important that we pay attention to this word. Don't neglect the written word. And don't underestimate the attack against the word of God, even from within the church. Be on guard against this attack on the word. For it is an attack on God's very voice. You hear anyone say that you're making the Bible an idol, watch out for them. You hear anyone saying, I don't need the word of God, I have fresh revelation from God, watch out for them. They're misled. Nothing will subjugate the word of God except the one who is the word and is coming again. And Peter is telling us that until he comes again, the word remains as the means by which God speaks to us primarily. God spoke, and he chose to speak and have his voice recorded in word, written that it might be passed on, written that it might be passed on where there is no error, and we can ensure that it is passed on well. And the voice still echoes. Every time we open the word of God, it echoes and speaks anew to us each day as we read with hunger the word that is alive. Listen to what Peter said in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Listen carefully in how this pertains to God's word. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Now listen to this. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The gospel message. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Pay attention to it. Cherish the gospel. We're never in a place where we're done needing the gospel. It's erroneous to think that the gospel brings me to Jesus and I'm done with it. No! 
The Word transforms us as the Holy Spirit uses it to make us more like Christ. That's part of the process of our sanctification. It is a supernatural transforming of the mind and the heart accomplished by the Spirit through the Word of God. Paul said in Romans 12 too, Don't be conformed to this world, the darkness, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How does that work? The illumination that the Holy Spirit provides through the Word of God that has been written. So this inner transformation, which is deepened continually by the Holy Spirit as you and I study the Scriptures, will be completed only on the great day when Jesus returns, and not until then. You're never at a place where you're done needing to abide in the Word of God. Pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So there is a day coming when this will not be needed. And that's the great day when Jesus returns. That's the hope of Jesus' return. This is the message Peter is teaching that's under attack. Because on that day, you and I will see Jesus as he truly is. The glimpse that they had at the transfiguration of him and his glory, that is what we will behold. And we will be made like him. Our faith finished and perfected by him. And so the scriptures are essential for us and will be until the one to whom they have pointed us to comes. And when Jesus returns... The prophetic word in its entirety will be completely fulfilled and then he will illuminate our hearts and our minds with his very presence and the prophetic word will be eclipsed forever by that presence. So the written word word is like a lamp shining in the world and the lamp of prophecy lights up the darkness of this world with a bright beam of hope and that hope is Jesus. And the message of the gospel illuminates the darkness of sin and hopelessness. And the message of the gospel through the power of the Spirit illuminates our lives. This is why Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 said, God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's referring back to that salvific event that Peter spoke of in chapter 1 in the first few verses. The Word of God has illuminated our hearts and our minds and our lives because we have seen and responded to the message of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has made us born again. And when Christians experience the return of Jesus Christ, it'll be like the daylight which dispels all the darkness of the night. And Jesus himself will be like the morning star whose rising signals the dawn. That phrase, morning star, is another prophetic scripture. Jesus is the one who brings the light of this great day of hope. It's like that first crack of dawn. That's what it's referring to. Because Jesus is the greater word, which is the light to our lives. He is referred to as the morning star. And prophecy speaks of this. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, fulfillment of all the Davidic prophecies, and the bright morning star of which Numbers 24, 17 referenced. And so, and this is incredible, This is what Peter is saying. The spoken word on Mount Sinai led to the given written word. The written word that was given pointed to the coming of the living word. And the written word of Scripture and the spoken word on the Mount of Transfiguration confirmed the identity of that living word. John understood this. In the beginning was the word, the greater and sufficient word, and that word was with God and the word was God. It's not the voice, it's not the word written, it's Jesus that both these other things pointed to. In him, 
John goes on to say in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1, was life. And that life was what? The light of men. Light. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And it will be eradicated when the morning star rises on the day of Jesus' return. So Jesus is the living word who has the words of life. John 6, 68. The disciples say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. (laughs) So the source of the words of eternal life is the living word that was referenced by the word of God that was given by the spoken word. This is why the author of Hebrews in the first two verses of the book says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Again, written word. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Jesus is the final utterance from God. And we would do well to pay attention to the Word of God, both Old Testament and New, because the written Word continues to point us to the living Word. In the darkness of sin, it points us to the light of Christ. In the darkness of this world, as we await the return of Jesus, it lights our path and gives us hope. Because it speaks of that day where the morning star will rise, which is the hope that we have. This world is not our home. In this world, we will have many problems. We will be persecuted for our faith. The world will hate us. Do you get the picture that maybe we shouldn't be surprised if this world is really tough and not comfortable and hard? The mistake to think that somehow the kingdom is here and now in its fullness. It's not. It's begun. It is here, but it's not yet. When Jesus returns, that is the day where the light in its fullness will eclipse and the word will not be needed anymore because we have in our very presence the one who is the living word of which the word testified, who speaks the words of eternal life. And so when that true light appears, the light of the word shall pale before him as a candle to the sun, but the word keeps speaking. God's spoken word is alive in Scripture. The echoes of the voice on Sinai and at the transfiguration are still speaking. This is my son. He is the one spoken of. He is the one written of. He is the living and final word. There is no other word needed. And he has the words of eternal life. So pay attention to the word. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, it says in Hebrews 4.12. Folks, if there's one thing you can take away from this, recognize the enemy and the world and your flesh do not want you, do not want you to uphold the word of God in your lives. They want the word to sit on a shelf. They want the word to sit on a shelf. They want you to be trying to find some spoken word, which God is not going to give you because it is not. The written word is that which God has given us. And it points us to the only other word we need, and that word is Jesus. So pay attention to the word. It points you to the light of Christ, and it will continue to do so. It leads you to Jesus, and it keeps leading you to Jesus every day. That's why we need it. It gives us the hope and expectancy for the return of Jesus. So pay attention, please, as a lamp shining in the darkness until the day Jesus returns. That's really the only day the Bible should be closed. That's the one day where we can finally do this. But until then, it should remain open. So Peter gives us two witnesses. What was seen and heard by the apostles and the written word, each confirming the other. And the purpose of these testimonies is to 
underline the authenticity of the message of the gospel, that this is a hope worth dying for. Faith worth dying for because it's founded in a person, in God, in Christ. Jesus is worth dying for, Peter says. This hope is trustworthy. Last week I quoted Spurgeon where he said, what is the object of faith that we're supposed to have? It's a person, a living, divine, appointed person. And who is that person? He is none other than Jesus. Jesus is the prophesied and divine Son of God. He was revealed in glory to the apostles and spoken of in the Old Testament, fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. And he is the source of all the promises of the word and is our hope because he's also the fulfillment of the word. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that all the promises of God which were given through Christ are fulfilled in the person of Jesus in his very presence. Spurgeon also says this. I like Spurgeon. The pith. I'm not even sure what that word means, but the pith, the essence of faith lies in this. I think it means this is brass tacks. The essence of faith for the Christian lies in this. Pay attention. A casting oneself on the promise. I love that. You just do a belly flop onto the promises of God. You're all in. No holding back. You just jump. You cast yourself on the promise that is ultimately Christ. God is trustworthy. His word is trustworthy. His promises are trustworthy. His messengers are trustworthy. So cast yourself on the one who is the promise, the fulfillment of the promise, and the source of the promise. Because he's coming soon. And that's our hope. When the world around us mocks us and causes us to doubt, remember that these promises are already as good as done. And when you struggle with your faith, go back and let the lamp shine again. Turn the flashlight on. Don't just carry it around. Peter saw the fulfillment of God's promises in Jesus. God is the promise keeper. His word will never fail, so don't lose heart. A song I really like says that his vow is a covenant unbroken. And Jesus said, I am coming again to take you with me, that where I am you may also be. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you? It's a vow. And his covenant has always been unbroken. He made it known through history, through his word. He'll never be unfaithful. He'll never walk out on you. We have no reason to doubt him, who he is, who he has been. He will always be. And though the future is still unfolding, Peter declares that with everything we've seen and heard, how can we not believe? So choose. Choose to trust in his character and his faithfulness. Choose to... Pay attention to the light of God's word, not your circumstances. Big mistake. Trust in the light of God's word, not in the light of your circumstances, because there's no light there. Trust in the light of God's word. Pay attention to it, and you will have a faith that cannot be shaken. You will be unshakable. Because soon, you and I will behold with unveiled eyes the fullness of the morning star the light of the presence of Jesus. But until then, keep your Bible open and let it guide you with its light because it will always guide you back to Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the gift of your word. And God, what a profound mystery and what beauty that you spoke, Lord Jesus, the universe into being. On the Mount Sinai, you spoke... You gave a written word which spoke and pointed us to one who was coming that would be the final utterance. And Lord Jesus, you speak life to us. You have the words of eternal life. You are the living word. 
And God, I pray that for myself and everyone who is um, with us, that we would not have our Bibles closed in our lives, but that until the day you return, Jesus, we would recognize that we don't need another spoken voice because there's no greater voice than you. But what we need is the living voice of the word, which is a lamp that will illuminate the darkness that we face. And, oh, Jesus, return soon because we long to see you face to face. We long to see the morning star rise, not only in our hearts, but to rise in this dark world. We ask these things, and we thank you that you are faithful, and we can trust in you, and that your word and who you are, you are trustworthy. We bless you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
It's an encouraging song to close with because that song speaks about ownership. And if you are a follower of Christ, he owns you, which means he's never going to let go of you because he's faithful and he's accomplished everything he needs to to keep you as his. If you have prayer needs, I want to encourage you to reach out to us. If there's people you want to call to pray with you, I encourage you to do that. You know, let's Let's drop the masks spiritually with one another about how we're doing. And uh, if you go to our website, there's some links about how you can send a prayer request to us at the office. Or if you'd like, uh, you can call us at the office, and one of us would love to pray with you. So may God bless you. May you be filled with joy. And may the light of God's word be shining in your life and keep every day pointing you to Jesus. God bless you. children of his. God bless you. Go in peace.